this case was particularly uh, lurid and disturbing. And if there was ever a case for maybe there shouldn't have been cameras, uh, this might have been the case. But I'm still a fan of cameras yeah. in the courtroom. Now time for our midnight interview. And my guest tonight is the American lawyer Lisa Bloom, who's worked on some of the most high profile sexual harassment cases in recent times. She's brought allegations against the former US President Donald Trump, Fox News's Bill O'Reilly and Bill Cosby, and also represented eight of Jeffrey Epstein's victims. She was present during the conviction and sentencing of Epstein's friend, Ghislaine Maxwell. On occasion, she says it moved her to tears. She was a one-time advisor to Harvey Weinstein, famously resigning after the New York Times published the allegations that sparked the Me Too movement. And I'm really pleased to welcome Lisa Bloom to Times Radio. Good morning, Lisa. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for being with us. Um, I'd love to dive into, first of all, before we talk a little more about you and your career, um, the very relevant story, really, that's been dominating the news headlines this week, the Amber Heard and Johnny Depp libel case. Um, many are calling the exposure around the trial and, and the vilifying of Amber Heard on social media at the end of the Me Too movement, uh, as someone so heavily involved, of course, in cases like this and in cases uh, around the Me Too movement. What do you make of those comments? This is not the end of the Me Too movement. This is one case in which a very wealthy and powerful guy was able to bring a defamation case successfully. But each case is decided on its own facts. Now, having said that, there is a lot of backlash to the Me Too movement. My clients and I are threatened every day. Sometimes we are sued for defamation or other things just for coming out and speaking out about sexual harassment. So we are in the middle of a backlash, but the movement is not over. And I think the backlash reflects the strength of the movement. So many women and men have come out publicly and talked about being victimized by sexual violence. And I think that's just going to continue. What is the treatment of Amber Heard? What does that mean for women now who might be thinking about speaking out about sexual harassment? Um, she's not completely innocent. Of course she's not. She was uh, found to have defamed Johnny Depp um, uh, on several different counts. But at the same time, um, it felt at times like uh, the jury had found uh, against her before the trial was over. It was a trial by social media. Does that yes. seriously concern you when you think about how women might or might not now want to pluck up the bravery to be able to reveal and report instances of sexual assault, sexual harassment? Well, it definitely concerns me. And I had to talk to several of my clients uh, last week and say uh, things have changed because all Amber Heard said was I am a public figure representing domestic abuse. She didn't name him. She didn't suggest that she was talking about her ex-husband. That's all that she said. And prior to this case, I think most of us would have said, that's not enough for a defamation case. You have to name him. You have to at least clearly identify him. You have to talk about specific incidents. And she didn't do any of that. You know, she did win $2 million on one of her own claims where Johnny Depp's attorney came up with a very specific false allegation against her that she staged a, a, a scene to make it look like she had been a victim of domestic violence. And that was false. That's the kind of thing that we typically see in a domestic violence case, a very specific factual allegation that's wrong. So I have to tell my clients, and I did this week. You know, even if you don't name the guy, if you just say, I'm a victim of domestic violence, I'm a victim of sexual harassment, and people can put it together and By kind jigsaw of or identification, out who can't they? Yeah, 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 yeah. Of course, that's, people can you know, piece it together. So that's, that's a whole different level of having to be careful now. Mm. She did present photos of her injuries, video recordings of Depp's meltdowns, witness testimony supporting her claims of abuse. But of course, uh, it was Depp um, uh, uh, bringing the libel case uh, against her. And as we say, uh, we have to respect the jury's decision there. He was awarded $10 million plus $5 million in punitive damages. Um, when you speak yeah. to your clients and in fact, when you when you speak to the lawyers working within the Bloom firm, within your organization, have they heard from um, victims of domestic violence? Have they directly had instances yet of where women will now pull away, will now step back from perhaps uh, launching um, actions, launching um, uh, perhaps, you know, trials, cases of sexual abuse or domestic violence? 
Yes, and I have personally spoken to witnesses, but let me be clear. Defamation is about speaking out publicly in the media. Amber Heard did an article in the Washington Post. If you file a lawsuit, you cannot be sued for defamation for what you say in the lawsuit. That is protected under what's called litigation privilege. So you can still file a lawsuit. You can still seek justice. You can go to the police and file a police report. What you have to be very, very careful about is speaking out publicly. Yeah, so you get privilege in a court of law, but you've got to be much more careful about what you say publicly. Yes. Should the libel trial have been televised? We you know, find that an odd notion here in the UK. And um, I think it fueled the flames, didn't it? Well, I've always been an advocate of the First Amendment and cameras in the courtroom. I had a show on court TV for many years. And I do think that uh, you know, we say sunlight is the best disinfectant. Uh, the courts are a branch of government. We should all have access to them. Anybody can walk into a courtroom, sit down and watch a proceeding. So why not have a camera in there and televise it? But I will say this case was particularly uh, lurid and disturbing. And if there was ever a case for maybe there shouldn't have been cameras, uh, this might have been the case. But I'm still a fan of cameras yeah. in the courtroom. I just wonder, because obviously people were recording stuff from their TVs. They were making memes. They were right. uh, exchanging clips on TikTok. They were altering clips. They were, um, yes. you know, editing together um, fake news effectively yes. in some part, um, all of which did not paint Amber Heard in a good light. Um, right. And uh, she is, you know, clearly the victim of something here. Um, mm -hmm. uh, obviously, well, she said it, that she was the victim of domestic I could jump in on abuse. that. Yeah, so, go on. You know, I, I've been speaking out about high profile cases for uh, decades. This one is probably the worst in terms of the social media hate that I've gotten for simply saying things like, I didn't think that the statement she made rose to the level of defamation. I have had so many trolls and haters and people coming after me. The Johnny Depp super fans are really uh, very aggressive. And that's only to me. I can only imagine what Amber Heard faced a million times worse than what I faced. Um, it's very disturbing. And I agree with you, taking clips from the trial and making them into memes and distorting things and saying, oh, she's fake crying. I mean, it was really vicious and ugly. Um, I don't know if any of this is attributable to Johnny Depp. I don't know if his publicists are behind it, but I do know he didn't call it off. And this was going on during the trial. And he could have said, you know what, to my fans, I appreciate that you support me, but, you know, stop. This is too much. And I want to win in the courtroom. And he, he didn't do that. And I found that to be troubling. Mm. Tell me what kind of abuse you were getting. Oh, I mean, I, I don't know if you even want me to say it on air, but every four letter word and I should die and I should be raped. And how could I? And, you know, I mean, it's it's really vicious and why were people i, I, I mean it huh, just explain why people were sending you that you were just simply saying that you didn't think what amber heard said reached uh reached the level of of a libel uh right. case reached reached the benchmark um you were giving your opinion on it but yet right. that seems incredibly hateful some of the stuff it, that you were getting it does so i Frankly, I, I get a lot of hate all the time, and I, a lot of it I just ignore. But this really was different. It was really vicious. It was personal. And why? I, I just think we have a cult of celebrity in this country. Uh, I experienced this with Michael Jackson years ago when I represented uh, a boy who was accusing Michael Jackson, the singer, of uh, sexual abuse. And the Michael Jackson fans were also uh, pretty aggressive and pretty vicious. But that was before social media. And I think it's just very easy for people to hide behind their computer and to put out these nasty things. And um, you really, it's, it's hard to get your brain around. It's almost like a religious experience people have in the cult of celebrity. Um, and if you say something against the celebrity that they love, uh, you know, they take it very personally. And it's a pile on, isn't it? Um, is yeah. that the worst amount of abuse You've had, I know you've had death threats, haven't you? You've had oh, many times you've had letters I mean, through the post. Has this been the worst yet or has there been a case in the no, past but, that? No, I think worse? when I represented four women accusing Donald Trump of sexual assault and sexual harassment in 2016 uh, during that election, 
Um, you know, we had to get private security at, at my law firm. Uh, you know, I've always had my home address is not listed anywhere. Um, I, you know, I have two large dogs who let me know if anybody's coming around. I mean, I'm not um, particularly concerned about it, honestly, because I feel that the people who threaten me are probably not likely to do something. If somebody was going to harm me, they would probably just do it. And I, you know, I live my life. I have a very good life. I, I don't, I'm not a victim. Um, but uh, I, I have regularly gotten a lot of death threats and a lot of ugliness. Is that when the job infringes on your personal life? Is there a fine balance there and and has that balance ever tipped in the wrong way where it's where it's really impacted you well well yes of course it's actually um it's not so much from that it's uh i you know i know that people have very strong feelings and i i say things and people don't like what i say and they could, they're free to disagree with me and they're free to reason with me you know i have a little tip for people which is if you want to change my mind you know, don't come at me like aggressive and hostile. You know, I, I've had people say, Lisa, you know what? I, I really respect you and your work, but you said this one thing and I don't agree. And here's why. Those are the messages I really read and think about because I do have an open mind. And if I'm wrong, you know, I'm open to being corrected. And that's really a better way. But in terms of the stress of the job, um, it is very stressful when you go after billionaires, as I often do on behalf of everyday people, you know, the billionaires don't just roll over. They have massive uh, PR machines and lawyers and teams of people who they pay and who really are on their side. And, you know, my client typically has me, uh, the other attorneys in my small firm. Uh, I hope they have family who supports them. And, you know, we just want a fair fight. We just want to get into the courtroom and have a fair fight and just getting to the courtroom and getting to have that fair fight, it can take years. And those years are difficult for my clients. So I have to be strong for them. I am. I, I have a balanced life. I go hiking and backpacking a lot. I, I try to turn off the stressful part. Um, and It must you know, be so hard, I though. I mean, uh, uh, you've spent decades representing women, and you must have heard some testimony that's that's really upset you, really, really rocked you. Oh. How do you well, keep that distance? And has there been a time where you have, you know, seriously had to had to think about whether this is a path that you continue to tread? Uh, yes, of course. I have thought that. I occasionally still do think that. Um, and when I hear my clients testifying about rape, for example, and going through the details of it, and then they send me a message of some social media hate that they got, uh, which happens all the time. And they're despondent and they're suicidal. You know, my heart breaks for them. And the system is so skewed against them. And uh, and like I said, people coming after me personally, suing me, for example, it, you know, it's it's hard. But listen, I'm a very I'm, I have a privilege. Um, I, I went to a good law school. I think I'm a pretty good lawyer. I have a husband and family who love me. I'm healthy. I'm strong. I have a law firm full of great lawyers. So uh, I try to keep everything in perspective. Uh, your mum, Gloria Allred, is well, a, a very well-known civil rights attorney with an established track record of taking on high-profile women's rights cases. Tell me what it was like growing up with her. And I just had a good phone call with my mom just an hour ago. Um, my mom uh, was a wonderful mom and she raised me a little differently than everybody else. I think, uh, you know, she didn't make cookies. She didn't care really what I wore. Um, what she cared about, what was in my brain? Was I learning things in school that were important? Was I learning to think critically? She liked to have debates at the dinner table. She would take one side. She would assign me the other side, like, let's say, the death penalty. And we would try to reason it out uh, or abortion, right? Things that were hot button issues. But, you know, you really had to think about the other issue. And I would usually be on the same side. But if she would assign me the other side, I really had to think it through. She wanted to know what I was reading. Um, and I was the same with my kids. My, I have adult children now, and I, I try to raise them to be thinkers, to think for themselves independently. Don't just go along with what everybody else does, um, because that's how my mom raised me. And uh, the influence of your mom, did she qualify as a lawyer after you were born? Is that right? She came into it a little bit later? Yes. 
She's about 10 years ahead of me on the uh, having her law law license. <laughs> uh, I was uh, I was, I think, in beginning high school when she got her law license and started practicing law. So there must have been a lot of nights where she was what studying, I guess. Oh, she worked so hard. I will never forget it. You know, when she went to law school, I think it was only about five percent of her class were women. Uh, 10 years later, when I went, it was a third. So that was a lot better. Now it's more than half. But uh, I remember her working very hard and studying until late at night. And I said to myself, I don't know what I'm going to do, but I'm not going to law school. (laughs) (laughs) Well, of course, you know, years later, uh, I'm finishing up college. It's time to figure out what I'm going to do. And I I went to law school. Mm. Uh, You represented eight of the U.S. financier Jeffrey Epstein's victims, one of whom also had allegations against Ghislaine Maxwell as well. Epstein died before his victims could find justice. Um, I'd love to know what it was like for you uh, when in December Maxwell was convicted of recruiting teenage girls for Epstein to sexually abuse. When that um, conviction came through, what was that moment like for you? It was very moving. Uh, even now, when you say it, I, I, I do feel a little bit emotional because I know what those victims have gone through. I know what my clients have gone through. Ghislaine Maxwell is a monster. She helped Jeffrey Epstein. He would not have been able to do the hundreds of crimes that he committed against girls and women without her. She was the one that lured them in that they thought, well, you know, it's a woman. I can trust her. I mean, it's horrendous, the lives that have been destroyed by these two, and that she would actually be brought to justice and criminally convicted. I never thought I would see the day. I did see the day. And it was just a very, very powerful thing. It must have been frustrating for both you and the victims, though, when Jeffrey Epstein was no longer there, was no longer there to face the charges uh, against him, um, having died in prison. How do you how do you reason with that? Of course, so many people will come to you because they want the outcome. They want the chance to rid themselves of the guilt, the pain that comes with being um, maybe a victim of domestic violence, maybe sexually assaulted, sexually abused, raped. What's it like for you and and for your client when when that justice that you're so desperate for can't can't be delivered? It was such a roller coaster ride with Jeffrey Epstein. First, he is arrested and he's in jail and he's going to face criminal charges. This is amazing. My clients who were girls from difficult backgrounds never thought they would see the day. That was incredible. That's the top of the roller coaster. And then bang, he was allowed to take his own life in prison. If that's what happened, I still have my doubts, frankly. Uh, because supposedly two prison officials both had to fall asleep at the same time for him to get away with killing himself. Maybe, maybe that's what happened. Uh, I don't know. But he did escape justice. And I would say shame on the prison system for allowing that to happen. What's been the case that really got you, whether it was because you didn't get closure, because it really upset you? Which, Which is the one that stands out? You know, it's always whatever case I'm working on right now, but um, I I do think of a case I had years ago. A 12-year-old girl came to me and she said I was sexually abused by my godfather and I have gone to the library and I have researched the difference between criminal and civil cases and I would like to bring a civil case and I know that I can be a Jane Doe, but I don't want to be a Jane Doe because why should I hide my head in shame? He's the one that did something wrong. He's the one who should be ashamed. So I would like to use my real name. My name is Desiree Bartak. I was blown away by this girl. And I spoke to her mother. I spoke to her therapist. And they were in agreement that she had made a good decision and she had really thought it through and it was okay. And so we filed the case using her real name. Uh, and we ultimately won a multi-million dollar outcome for her. And he also was criminally convicted and incarcerated. And she just was so inspiring to me. And and I'd like to think, you know, maybe a little bit of that was like how I was as a little girl. Because mm-hmm. I I don't know if I would have had that level of courage, but I did do that level of research. <laughs> and yeah. I did go to the yeah. library, 12 and research years old everything. As well. And I still do. So she was she was really an inspiration yeah. to me. 
<laughs> You're on record um, as calling your decision to be employed as an advisor by the disgraced movie producer Harvey Weinstein. Uh, you've, you've called it a colossal mistake. What convinced you to work for him in the first place? Well, at the time, I was doing about 95% of my work on behalf of victims and about 5% on behalf of people who were accused, who I felt, after doing my research, were either falsely accused or the accusations were exaggerated and accused only of verbal misconduct, sexual harassment. Not I never represented anybody accused of sexual assault, except that eventually Harvey Weinstein became accused of sexual assault and then I immediately resigned. But when I did the research at the time, when he approached me, he was this film producer for, who frankly wasn't all that well known, who, as I understood it at the time, had a couple of women accusing him of verbally sexually harassing him. And he was willing to apologize, make amends and change. And I thought, well, here's something different. You know, maybe I can be on the other side and convince a guy who's accused to do the right thing and not fight the women and not go after them and just apologize and, and be a better person. And that would be very inspiring to me. So many of my clients, for example, my Trump accusers, who I was representing at the time said, can't he just admit it and apologize? That would really mean a lot to us. So we all know how completely wrong I was about this guy who turned out to be a monster. And when the first woman came out and accused him of sexual assault, I was in shock and uh, immediately resigned. And, you know, I'm to this day, just appalled that I was ever associated with this monster. There was just a court of appeals decision upholding his criminal conviction yeah, I which I read yesterday. I read every word of it because it's actually very helpful to me in my other cases, allowing us to call me Too witnesses, for example, other women who were victimized by the same person and upholding a certain kind of expert witness testimony that I use all the time. So there's some great stuff in that decision for me, but um, I'm just uh, very, very sorry I was ever associated with him. Do you think he charmed you? No. I mean, again, I did my research. Uh, there were a lot of prominent feminists who I don't, I'm not going to name because I don't want to embarrass them, but who were vouching for him. Um, there were prominent women at his company who said he's a great guy. And, you know, there's just a couple of women who say he, you know, verbally uh, came on to them and nothing happened. And so I, you know, I did all the research that I could do. There was an investigator who went, deep into his background. And I mean, I, anyway, I knew what I knew at the time when I knew differently, I, I got out mm. and frankly, that's, I think that's all any human can do. Mm. Um, this has come from your mum, Gloria Allred, but, it, but I think it's a fine assessment. Um, and I know that you agree with this too. And it's that women get more radical as we get older because we experience more injustices yeah. Do you think we also have a clearer sense of what's right and wrong too, and that actually there are too many blurred lines to negotiate when we're young or younger? I think, you know, I, I love that quote from my mom, and it is true. When I'm picking a jury, I prefer to have older women <laughs> because uh, the odds are by the time you're 50 or 60, you have been sexually harassed and God forbid, maybe worse, or you have friends who have been, uh, you know, and Maybe when you're 20, this hasn't happened yet. Uh, I hope it never happens to any woman, but this is the reality. So um, uh, I, I do think that we get more radical as we get older. Also, as we get older, uh, I'm 60. I really like being 60 because I, you know, I just say what I think. I don't worry about what people think of me. I like to say a girl becomes a woman the day she stops worrying about what people think of her. We should have our own standards. We live up to our own standards. Uh, you know, I hope people like me, I guess, kind of, but I really don't care very much about that. <laughs> well said. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for joining us. It's been fascinating uh, and insightful as well. The US attorney, Lisa Bloom. Thanks for speaking to us on Times Radio. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. 